you have said oxidation. Okay, I'll have to restart. I didn't give him a fair warning. Okay, welcome to all the others who have uh, joined our session for today. Uh, today's program is, can you hear me clearly? Okay. Uh, today's program is basically aimed at people who are not regularly handling the ventilator and who are now coming on board because of the requirements. So, we will be a bit limited in our presentation because otherwise it will take a long time and it is very difficult to conceptualize in one lecture. But first thing is why do we need ventilation? One of our colleagues said oxygenation. So if I say I put an oxygenator into your artery or into your central line, and we oxygenate the blood. So that would be fine. What is your opinion? Be honest. Don't worry, you don't have to appear smart. It took me a long time to conceptualize when I was a junior resident. So if everybody knew everything, then I am the wrong person over here. So basically, oxygenation will happen. But what happens? Carbon dioxide is produced and that carbon dioxide has to go out. So, if this has gone up, something wrong. So, no, when I go, I think all of them will go like this. No, that's okay, okay, that is fine. So, we can oxygenate adequately, but the oxygen will be utilized and carbon dioxide will be produced, which will cause a fall in the pH. So, the carbon dioxide has to be washed out. So, the main purpose is, we have to ventilate the patient. We may give 30% oxygen, we may give 70% oxygen, we may give 100% oxygen, depending on the requirements of the patient. But ventilation is going to remain fixed as per that patient's requirement at that point of time. So carbon dioxide washout is the main purpose of ventilation. It is definitely helped by giving oxygen. If I ventilate with only air, even then patient will have some degree of oxygenation. So oxygen may come, but it is not the first thing. But it is a very important thing, but carbon dioxide removal is the main thing. So this may be affected by increased airway resistance. If the patient is not able to breathe out, the airway is narrow when we expire. The airways expand when we inspire. So it is the point at which carbon dioxide is to be eliminated that you will find the problem of increased airway resistance. This may be worsened by the lungs becoming thick. And it is not only the lungs, but it's also the chest wall. Uh, my friend over here, he is thin. So, the lungs can be inflated very easily. When cut, you know, his lungs can be in, inflated even more easily because less fat is there on his chest wall. Okay, but he and I and Khairun will have some problems more because our thoracic wall compliance, that is, what is compliance? Change in change per, unit per unit pressure, per change in unit pressure. So, the compliance, when we blow a balloon, birthday parties, you may be blowing up 50 balloons, you will find one particular balloon, we are trying to blow, but it is not blowing, you maintain the pressure for some time, then it starts expanding. The compliance is low, and all our alveoli, have got a thing called time constant. You maintain the give up pressure, most of the alveoli start to expand, but some will need, they are this lazy alveoli. 
sleepy and weary. You maintain the pressure for some time, then they start expanding. So, if you release the ventilation pressure early, then that alveoli will remain collapsed. It will not be recruited. It will not be recruited. And therefore, we will face the problem of partial collapse of the alveoli. So, ventilation will be less, but the blood circulating through will be more. So, there is a mismatch between oxygen going into the lungs and though the blood is there, less oxygen is available to be picked up. We may have another scenario where in the upper part of the lung, ventilation is going on very nicely because it is more compliant, it is less under pressure unlike the alveoli at the bottom, but the hydrostatic pressure is less. So if the hydrostatic pressure is less, then the blood supply to the upper zone is less. So good oxygenation, but no RBC to pick up the oxygen. No passengers. No passengers. So it is as useless if you run a bus service which does not pick up passengers. So there is nothing. So you can have either the ventilation is adequate, but circulation is an inadequate in hypotensive patients. Or you may have good circulation but poor ventilation. Okay, in the lower part. Lower part, circulation is very good but alveoli are not opening. Okay, so if your patient is hypotensive, you will have fall in saturation. So if you just giving oxygen and tinkering with the modes of ventilation will not help. Hypotension has to be treated whether you need to give volume to fill it up or if the heart is failing, you give an inotrope to push the blood up the hydrostatic pressure gradient. That is what is going to be needed. So ventilation, perfusion. Okay. At any point, if you think I am talking a bit in jargon or excessive, please stop me and we will clarify because this has to be very simple. You have to be able to deliver. So, change in lung compliance, now hypotension, ventilation, perfusion, mismatch, intrapulmonary shunting, diffusion defects. Diffusion defects if the alveolar wall has thickened and the gas cannot go out because of fibrosis. So, these things, even though oxygen is there, the blood vessel is open, but the interstitium has fibrosis. So, you may have diffusion defect. So, air resistance can increase. It can increase due to secretions in the airway. Okay, you have secretions in the airway. So, when you are trying to wean a patient and you find there is a secretions. So, there is a thing called clinical pulmonary infection score. <coughs> so that will give you the x-ray finding, the, the, the secretions, the TLC, like this. So that score you can use, but basically if you have increased secretions, patient is breathing and there will be increased resistance to flow because the lumen has now become narrow. Lumen has now become narrow. So, if you are having secretions over here, so then there is the resistance to flow. If you have a spasm, then the resistance to flow is increased. If this mucosal thickening occurs because of allergic reaction or because of extra fluid and the mucosa has become thickened and so then the total free lumen inside the trachea or bronchiole is going to be narrowed. So a growth inside the tracheal lumen, a growth inside the tracheal lumen or an external tumor compressing and narrowing the lumen. So what happens is 
the driving force, heat pressure of the gas going in is dependent upon the air flowing and the fourth power of the radius. So radius is so important. So bronchospasm, secretions, they are so important because it is not affected by the absolute measurement. Four times, fourth power of that radius. So a two, if a two millimeter difference has been made, when a, a narrowing has been done, the effect is compounded by two into two into two into two. Two to four, four to eight, eight to sixteen. Sixteen times the impact will come with a change in the radius. So importance of having bronchodilators, clearing secretions is so, so important. Mucosa is thickened, when a swollen because of edema. So you can nebulize glycopyrrolate, you can nebulize ipratropium. Okay, reduce the total fluid in the patient, unnecessary fluid load and secretions in the airway. And these same secretions, <coughs> you will understand, even in your circuit tubings, all the air is going out and going through the ventilator circuit back into the ventilator. So if water collects in that, Again, the resistance to flow is increased. The length is also important. So in the circuit tubings, the length is important. In the endotracheal tube, that is why if it is too long, then we cut it and about one inch away from the mouth, we put in the universal connector so that the length is reduced. But the length is not having the four times, not four times, four to the eight name to the power 16 times that effect on the radius. So while length is important, the diameter, the fourth power of the radius is the amount by which it affects our flow. Okay? This is fine. So what are the factors contributing to airway resistance? You have extubated the patient. When the patient was intubated, Vocal cords were dilated and kept open. Now the patient, when he inspires, vocal cords open, but when he expires, it goes through narrowed vocal cords. Hmm? <clears throat> then the endotracheal tube, I mentioned the length and the radius. If you have used too narrow a tube, now will come the time when in your initial anxiety to intubate the patient, you will find, oh, it's not going. So instead of 8.5 in an adult, you put 7. Not going, 6.5. Chala to gya na. Chala to gya na. But remember, this has fourth power of the radius, 16 times impact. So you may have to take your time, call in a person more proficient. He can use a tube exchanger and change it to a larger diameter tube. So don't keep the airway resistance high. If the ET tube size is too small and length is more, then that will cause extra resistance. Condensation in the ventilation circuit. So nowadays we try to have the heated humidifiers with a heated coil in the tubing, inside the tubing, so that water doesn't condensate and collect, okay? Then the patient develops asthma or is an asthmatic, has bronchospasm. We have a patient, <coughs> he has got an irritable airway, everything is fine, but every alternate day he goes into spasm and we start from all over again. In the morning when I come back, patient is back on my sir, uska thura asthma, a spasm ho raha. So then you are using bronchodilator after bronchodilator with its allergogenic potentials. So treating the asthma properly, the bronchiectasis, emphysema, bronchiolitis, you see, they all will cause increased resistance. And this increased airway resistance means when I'm breathing, your chest wall just relaxes and the air goes out, isn't it? If there is spasm, then your asthmatics from medicine, you will see the patient just is trying to expire with force. The work of breathing is high, he gets fatigued more quickly. 
So, if the patient has much increased work of breathing, he may get tired, he may have hypoventilation, and therefore ultimately ventilation will fail and oxygenation will also fail. Okay? So, here he can't eliminate carbon dioxide, and here failure of the heart and lungs to provide oxygen for metabolic needs. If the blood pressure is not adequate to circulate the RBCs through the lungs, then also it cannot pick up oxygen, and it is compounded by the patient having difficulty. So, if I have a good expansion, lower alveoli open, oxygenation is more. If I have shallow breaths, lower parts don't open, so they are having low ventilation, less oxygen, so RBC already compromised with hypotension. ARDS patients, they will very often have a complication because of the raised intrathoracic pressure, trying to reduce the fluids, patient may be hypovolemic, and that may again cause failure to, for the heart and lungs to provide oxygen. So compliance, as you said rightly, change in volume per unit pressure change. So you have got a static compliance and you've got a dynamic compliance, okay? Static compliance is you stop the breath, manual hold, and it gives you a measurement, no flow state. But this is not normal. We are always breathing. We are always breathing. So if we are breathing, then a static compliance gives us less than the maximum information and build more. Static compliance, we will use the plateau pressure, we will show you the plateau pressure on the curve and minus the peak. So then tidal volume, change in pressure, tidal volume divided by plateau pressure minus P is your static compliance. But as I said, Bill Mange more, I want dynamic compliance. Okay? Because that is what normally is there. So at that time there is airflow, we do not stop the ventilation. And this is, you use a peak airway pressure. So ventilation is going on. On the graph, you measure the peak airway pressure minus the peak and divide the tidal volume by that. That is your dynamic compliance. Dynamic compliance is usually lower because you have not stopped it. You know, kabi kabi, you think that which is more, which is less, which is more, which is less. If you stop something, you try to overcome it, so your static compliance is higher, 40 to 60. But your dynamic compliance is 30 to 40. Okay, milliliter volume change per centimeter pressure change. Compliance is clear. So, then we will show you some graphics. Hmm? Why do we want graphics? Usually, uh, Khairul is very unhappy whenever I come, if the patient is showing a uh, different uh, 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 volume times color, pressure times uh, graphic, I tell, uh, why is this on? Why am I not seeing the loops? Uh, I am always in the loops. Tintin ka dog jo hai na, star he moves around in loops. So, I am always into loops. Why? Because it gives me some important information. But there is also some information to be obtained by the scalar, that is the pressure time, volume time, graphs. But then we don't look for it. That is the problem. We will show you. He has promised me that I will be able to draw and show you some things. Achha, purpose of monitoring graphics includes that it allows you to interpret, evaluate, and troubleshoot the ventilator and the patient's response to the ventilator. So we will be able to identify what is happening, whether there is an air leak, whether there is a bronchospasm, whether there is a, you know, the chest drain has been put and or bronchopleural tissue and everything is going out or a drain has been put so the leak is there and it monitors the patient's disease status. What is the disease status? Compliance of the lung and the airway resistance. Now whatever contributes to the compliance 
whatever contributes to the airway resistance, that is your medical disease. And we assess the patient's response to therapy. You give a bronchodilator, you see that the compliance improves, resistance drops. You do suctioning, compliance improves, resistance drops. And you monitor ventilator function. Whether excess tidal volume, excess minute volume is going on, whether FiO2 is coming, oxygen that you set, whether it is coming, it will give an alarm. It will allow fine tuning of the ventilator to decrease the work of breathing. Decrease the work of breathing, longer the tubing, the patient is taking breath, not from here, but through a long tube. As I was discussing the other day, if you have taken hookah through the long pipe, you really have to pull for that beautiful aromatic gas to reach your lungs. Okay? So, the longer the tube, resistance will be there. Huh? So, it will allow you, and that will increase work of breathing. So, how do I help it? We can add some pressure support. So, I have to generate a negative pressure for the gas to come. If I give the ventilator a small bit of pressure, so that instead of me having to generate the negative pressure, that four, five centimeter pressure is coming from the ventilator, then I can breathe. Enjoy my hookah. So we should, I design one hookah where it gives a pressure support and wonderful, I think my hookah, kya um, bolte usko hookah? Parlor will have bigger business with their Less effort. Huh. So your ventilator, less effort and pressure support will give you that ease of breathing. Now, if I increase pressure support too much, what will happen? I wanted to increase like this breath, but suddenly I am having to breathe even though I didn't plan to breathe so much. So pressure support too much is also a problem. So too much of a good thing is a problem. So we may need to again adjust the pressure support, bring it down from 8 or 12 so that the patient, if I was breathing like this and too much pressure support comes, what will happen? So very quickly, so inspiration period has become less. So then I have to adjust it because now what do I do with that extra period left over? Now the lung, once I have reached my peak inspiration, the flow rate has decreased, I want to expire. But we had set an expiratory time of 2 seconds, but now 2.5 seconds is there for breathing. So after inspiration, I am not continuing, but I should have continued. So now we are having a ventilator is finding that the problem is patient wants to breathe out. He has too much time, but the, uh, originally the ventilator has not taken care of that time for the inspiration. So in 3 second cycle, 0.5 second inspiration, 2 second for expiration, now 0.5 there is a mismatch. So we have to reduce the pressure support. Now suppose I give too little pressure support, 5 centimeter is needed, I am giving 3 centimeter pressure support. So when I was taking hookah, I was prepared. I knew I will do it for twice and then wait while the pipe passes round and comes to me. Okay. But when I have to breathe every time and I am already, you spoil my habit by giving me a little bit of pressure support, but not too much. So I expect that it will come easily. But after three centimeter, the rest of the resistance I have to take because the machine is not covering it. So pressure support is too low. If my airway resistance is high, lung airway resistance is high, my pressure support, normally on ventilators, spontaneously breathing, I have to give 5 to 6 centimeter pressure support to overcome the circuit resistance. Now, if there is an extra airway resistance in my tracheobronchial tree, I will have to give some extra pressure support. I have given only 5 but I need 8 
So I will have discomfort breathing because I am not able to breathe because of secretions, because of tumor, because of mucosal edema, because of asthma, whatever the reason. But I will have difficulty. So again, work of breathing will increase. I will also panic. Oh, I am tied to this ventilator and it is not giving me. I will suffocate. So patient's psychology will also become anxious prone. He will start breathing more and more. And the ventilator is now not prepared to give him more than what we have said. And therefore, he will fight the ventilator. Then we say he is fighting the ventilator, give him sedation. If that is not working, give him relaxant. But what was that fault? I was giving too little pressure support. Now try to think how easily the thought is coming. If I talk only pressure support and say do this, do this, it will never conceptualize. So if you need me to repeat, please tell me. But otherwise I will continue. Can I continue? So pressure support around 5-6 cm to overcome the circuit, breathing circuit. Because the tubings go inside the ventilator, not only that corrugated tubing, it is also going inside the ventilator, which you cannot see. Then the airway resistance. So if the lungs are otherwise okay, pipe, patient is on pressure support and breathing spontaneously. But if my airway is having secretions, if there is spasm, I will need some more pressure support. So you will see six, eight. 7, 9, 10 centimeter pressure support. That is effectively 5 is for the circuit and machine and the rest is for patient. Okay, so we will need this to optimize ventilation. Otherwise, too much pressure support also and my cattle volume will also go up. So then my carbon dioxide can fall. Okay, and patient comfort Patient will be comfortable only when the machine that is delivering the gas is matching what the patient needs. So you give me too much pressure support, you give me too little pressure support, you give me if the pressure was too high and my tidal volume is coming in very quickly, my inspiratory time is too short and I am not yet ready to expire. So again there is a mismatch. So, Ventilator may patient comfort is affected if these are not taken care of. Okay, so here you see I was telling pressure times color. So here you have got pressure and you have got a time. So the pressure if this is touching the baseline, there is no peak. Now, after a point of time, the patient's pressure waveform will increase and you will find a peak in spreading pressure is reached, it falls down, there may be a plateau and then the expiration continues and then if the ventilator is doing it, this same thing will be continued because there is no patient effort. Either patient is not breathing or you have given paralysis with relaxants. But if the patient makes an effort, achha, in order to prevent the alveoli collapsing, usually we maintain a peak again of 4 to 5 centimeter water pressure. So now if the patient makes an effort, then the circuit pressure drops slightly, again it goes up. So negative deflection just before the patient triggers the breath. The airway pressure will fall and the patient will trigger a breath. Okay? Previously, we used to do it on the basis of pressure. The pressure fell and the ventilator cycled. But then it was found that the patient's, that pressure drop makes the patient anxious, makes his work of breathing more. So rather, what happens is, in a closed circuit, a gas, baseline gas flows all the time. Okay, now can I draw on this now? I can't. Can you connect?
So what happens is you have a circuit, a circuit going like this. So there is a gas flowing in this circuit. So how do I know that uh, the patient is going to breathe? A baseline say three, four liters is always flowing per minute. Now, when I make an inspiratory effort, if I have got an the limb in which there is a flow sensor, when I breathe across this sensor, there will be a drop in flow, not pressure. So flow is less sensitive and more sensitive instead of pressure drop. So even though the patient is not feeling uncomfortable, he may find that the ventilator will sense that this patient made an inspiratory effort. So the flow in that closed limb, this closed limb, which is, there is the sensor here, flow sensor, and it will sense it and tell that a few ml came in and oh, this patient made an effort. So the patient does not feel the discomfort of pressure drop. Just the baseline flow that was going on continuously, just a few ml came and that is immediately reflected in the ventilator cycle, flow cycle. Okay, this makes it easier for the patient to breathe. So the ventilator will cycle on that basis. Okay, so uh, the, over here what happens is initially when the patient is breathing, airway resistance, you saw that line going up like this, you saw one line going up like this, that was the airway resistance. It went to the peak pressure then dropped and then it was horizontal for some time, that was the plateau pressure. So in dynamic compliance you notice peak inspiratory pressure minus the peak and that was the, yeah. and in the static compliance, it is the static, that is the plateau pressure minus the peak, which is the dynamic compliance. Okay. So, why was the uh, static compliance higher? Because, because you saw peak inspiratory pressure was always high. So, from a high peak inspiratory pressure, the same peak is subtracted. Say from 10, if I have subtracted 5, I have got 5. So the tidal volume is 500 ml divided by 5 is 100. Now, if I am taking the static compliance, now the pressure fell to the plateau. So plateau was suppose 6 or 8. Now 8 minus 5 is 3 and 500 is the tidal volume. So my compliance is higher because the denominator is smaller now. So that is why your static compliance has got a higher value than the dynamic compliance. Dynamic, dynamic compliance is measuring the higher peak pressure. So the denominator becomes bigger. So the dynamic compliance is lower value, 30 to 40. Static compliance is 40 to 60. <laughs> Easy to remember now. Otherwise, you know, magapta ke rakna patta, and you cannot remember it. Okay. So, can we do it? Okay, okay. So, then we have then that total area under that curve that you saw. That is the mean pressure. That is the mean pressure. But for you, once that resistance in the upper part is the resistance that you saw, then it is the alveolar expansion. The rest of that curve under that is the alveolar expansion that is occurring. As I told you, time constant, some will take longer time to expand. So once the gas flows through the trachea, that part, higher part, the rest of that area under the curve is comprising of the area we are interested in, the alveolar expansion. So whatever causes better alveolar expansion, is what we want. 
whatever causes better angular expansion is what we want. So that is why looking into the graphics, that will give us an impression whether I am targeting my alveolar ventilation or am I stuck with the airway resistance. Okay, that is why that graph is important. Previously, I used to hate graphs because nobody explained to me. This graph is maga. And mug up to today, may read tomorrow, forget, or maybe tonight, forget. So, but if you understand like this, once I will show you the picture again, you will see. Now you will understand and remember what we were talking about. Okay. Nahi hoga, to chalega, but hone se acha hoga. Just a minute, please. Remember, I am also very much, very poor at technology, but I am trying to use the technology to its fullest so that I can give you some better uh, what is understanding. Otherwise, everything is in the book. I don't need to take a class. Everything is in the book. Oh, yeah. What is the advantage of having good people with you to don't exploit <laughs> Exploitation is the name of the game. Well, yeah. Yeah, good. So I was talking to you about the resistance. You see, this was the curve I showed you previously. Hmm? So in the previous one, you saw that outline. So here you can see this is the peak inspiratory pressure reaching here, and this is the airway resistance component. And this is the alveolar distending pressure. Okay, so if this becomes high, you know which part we are addressing. If this becomes high, you know that we are talking of airway resistance. Are we clear? So, area under the curve represents the mean airway pressure. I have already told you. Okay, so what it can tell us, we are trying to assess lung over distension airway obstruction, bronchodilator response. So if the compliance improves, you can see this picture here. This you will have over here. 
This is the inspiratory part. This is the inspiratory compliance. This is the expiratory compliance. Okay, so we can see if I have given a bronchodilator, whether this curve from here improved and became like this bronchodilator. So again, compliance and airway resistance, work of breathing, flow starvation, the peak inspiratory flow rate. Now you will find that we are giving an oxygenation and suppose 4 liters per minute. If I am giving somebody 4 liters per minute, 6 liters per minute, but what is the peak inspiratory flow rate? It may vary from 50 to 120. If I am anxious and I am a bit exercising, it may go up. So peak inspiration and if the ventilator setting is not automatically compensating, then I will have flow starvation. Okay, if the flow is excess, I want to breathe like this, but the flow becomes very quick and I am having to breathe quickly. So there may be leak. So this has gone into the patient and it should come out completely. Now, I will show you in the subsequent pictures, it may stop here. What is that? The flow has gone out. Now we think it is leak. It is leak, but it may not be leak. What is it measuring? The air going in, the ventilator compared stable volume, 500 ml went in, 450 ml came out. What is the reason? Leak. Leak. It may have leaked out through a bronchopleural fistula. It may have leaked out beside the cuff of the endotracheal tube. It may have leaked out because a small disconnect, partial disconnect in the circuit, a hole in the circuit, many reasons. But it is only, it is like a trained dog. It only knows what it has been told to do. It recognizes that this went in and this came out. This was 50 ml short. So I am having a leak of 50 ml every time. Every time, wrong. Some air may be going in because the airway has dilated. So, though the airway has dilated, there is a small tumor inside. During the inspiration, air goes in very beautifully. When it is coming out, the airway has narrowed. So, therefore, some air did not come out and the expiratory valve it is reading it as leak. But basically it may be air trapping. The air has not come out. So it may be air trapping. It is remaining trapped in the alveoli, but the ventilator will tell you leak. So you have to understand, if it is so, how will you know that it is leak or it is air trapping? If non anesthetist can tell, 50 rupees abhi de dunga. Cash reward. Because each time some air is remaining trapped, gradually, now the pressure, the thoracic pressure will start to rise, the airway pressure will start to rise, the residual volume will become higher. So now you know that this patient is actually not a leak, but is air trapping. So auto peep, etc. They will increase. Okay. <coughs> okay. So remember, it may tell leak. It may also tell that, and it will also tell us about the triggering effort. So. Yet for time, let us. Not enough. Change the rogia. Not changed. Ah, again. Okay. No, just come. Okay. So I had told you this was the inspiration. This was the inspiration. Okay. 
so it was gradually coming up up to this point then suddenly from here the curve became for each change in pressure volume change was not much for each change in pressure volume change was not much but come this point for every small bit pressure change was for every small bit of pressure change volume became very high this is called the inflection point at the lower part it is the lower inflection point hmm? then the patient reaches the peak over here and this is telling the dynamic compliance okay now as it is going down again you see volume was not changing much at a point it starts dropping this is the upper inflection point okay this whole curve is called hysteresis we are not worried about the name but what does it imply okay so volume change per unit pressure change is the dynamic compliance okay now you have got this and then you see suddenly you find that instead of this you are getting a condition in which this is looking like a bird's beak so though you are increasing pressure and volume was increasing suddenly you keep on increasing pressure but volume does not increase so you are over distending the lung so the pressure is rising but the volume is not rising when you keep giving pressure and the, it doesn't distend any more that is what you should avoid that is what you should avoid so this is called beaking and the, uh, this you should reduce your tidal volume or the pressure so that this pressure is this again change changes back to this okay so yeah so you see that if the compliance falls so the change is pressure is high but volume is less so increase inspiratory resistance this is what you had expected from the midline so if this was the midline you had expected it to be like this but what happened instead was you are getting increased inspiratory resistance then you have the lower inflection point over here and then it goes up okay so as airway resistance increases this loop becomes wider and expiratory resistance also is going to be there so it becomes fatter and fatter by the slim man trick bar mein fatter so as air resistance increases loop becomes wider so increase inspiratory resistance you may get this is where the practical thing is coming check whether your tube is kinked whether patient is biting on the tube huh? very important suddenly the shape changes from this to this so thinking or it is biting okay yeah so now patients in whom pediatricians use more surfactant therapy so surfactant without surfactant the alveoli tend to collapse the surfactant allows the lungs to remain open because the surface tension forces are reduced the you put uh, bubbles I mean, water on the glass and you will find the round round uh, small small uh, globules that is because the surface tension is trying to change it to the smallest surface area and it is remaining the surfactant reduces that surface tension so that the alveoli don't tend to collapse into the smallest size okay so if you have given surfactant therapy or the patient has got emphysema so instead of going like this 
it is already over here on the other side of that line. So instead of the graph being on both sides of the line, everything is on one side and this has gone up very nicely. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And then it has gone and come back. And here the compliance is less. So the patients you are going to get, patients you are going to get are this. Patients with ARDS compounded by congestive heart failure or collapse of the alveoli, the compliance will be less. So you will get a shape like this. So be familiar with the shape of this curve. Be familiar with the shape of this curve. Okay. So our aim is that we will bring this our aim that we want to bring this curve back to this. Our aim to bring this curve back to this. This is our aim. Okay? So, you have got other things. I was telling you that you may have this has gone in and then it is coming back so, my handwriting may thora say it should have been both here, so you should forgive me. But still, you have got a pressure volume loop, pressure volume loop, and here there is a leak. It has not come down, it, it has not expired completely. Okay, it may also be, as I said, due to air being trapped beyond the partial obstruction. Okay, but generally, this will tell you about unless the secretions, uh, I mean, a solid amount of I mean, thick and um, viscous uh, secretions have accumulated in the distal airways, uh, you suddenly don't expect this. So this will then be a clinical scenario may suddenly cure within hours. So it is most probably an early. Okay, you will recognize this. So then you check your circuit with a cup leak, what because what happens is, when the pressure to inflate an ERDS lung happens, adult respiratory distress syndrome, sorry, I penalize my residents if they talk in abbreviation. Now, so adult respiratory distress syndrome. So in that, because the pressure is high, then the cuff and the trachea, so that compression may lead to some leak around it if the pressures are too high. If the pressures are too high, it may just distend the trachea and it may pass out from the uh, cuff, beside the cuff and you may see a little bit of leak. So, I have told you that this is the lower inflection point. Hmm? So, this is, once this is quick, it comes here. If this comes here, <coughs> that means from here it will go up that means the lung is becoming more inflatable. The recruitment of previously collapsed alveoli has occurred. So your patient is improving. So if you give more peak, so that FiO2 peak, we were talking all the time. If you give more peak and then that opens up the alveoli earlier, then you will find this will occur. And then the saturation will improve. So whenever the peak is better, your required inspiratory oxygen concentration will go down. If your peep is helping, then FiO2 will go down. Why? Because your main target was increasing oxygenation. Alveoli was collapsed, so oxygenation was not good. So to help the patient, I was giving increased oxygen. Now you don't keep increasing oxygen, so you increase the oxygen a little bit, then you increase the peep. You say, oh, it doesn't work. Okay, in the meantime, increase the oxygen a little bit. Then again, increase the peak. As the pressure, the peak maintains that whatever alveoli have descended, don't allow to collapse. So then, gradually you will find that it may start going up from here. So, point of alveolar opening, that is the recruitment. This is the value of the lower inflection point. So, some lung protection strategy suggests keeping the peak just above the lower inflection point. So, if you bring it 
if your peep is lower, it will collapse and come down. So keep your peep if this, if this was your pressure at which the inflection point started, you keep your peep slightly more. Keep your peep slightly more than the pressure of the lower inflection point. Okay? No confusion. See, this is what you have to do with your ARDS. Huh? By doing this, we have to recruit the peep. You have to recruit the lung, recruit the alveoli, the incremental peep to recruit the alveoli. You are not recruiting peep. Peep is the method. Peep is the method. You come by taxi, you come by bus. Huh? So, it is the method. Okay, P, FiO2, P, FiO2. If you only increase FiO2 and all the alveoli remain collapsed, useless. So, the smart guy thought, my, I have temporarily increased the inspired oxygen, but let me increase the P because I have to open up the alveoli. But then how much? I don't get, but the saturation has not improved. So, I increase the FiO2 a bit more. I keep doing this until I point at the magic point, wow, Kulia, Simpson, inflection point. So after you have done that, you have checked a little bit more, then you go back and maintain the peak slightly above that of the lower inflection point. Lower inflection point is coming down, then, uh, then, then, then your peak also will come down. This is important, very good point. The moment you find that your lower inflection point is coming with lower pressure, with lower pressure, lower pressure, you also keep reducing your peak, keep reducing your peak, but always slightly more than the lower inflection point. Okay? I am trying to avoid mumbo jumbo. Peep is positive end expiratory pressure. At the end of expiration, we breathe out without any resistance. We have zero peep, na? No positive end expiratory pressure? Wrong. The vocal cords, because we continue to breathe, some amount of resistance is provided. So we cycle to the next inspiration before everything has gone out. So three centimeter peak ke as pass always is there. If we do a tracheostomy and we open it to the atmosphere, peak is zero. And alveoli collapses. So everything was fine, sir. We weaned the patient off, P tube and all our lower resistance. A day later or 12 hours later, saturation starts to drop. Alveoli are collapsing because there is no peak. So what we do? Now we come to your point again. You put either a tracheolite or a humidifier with an oxygen port, which is antivirus properties, we have asked. So you will connect it. So oxygen will go a little bit, one, one liter, half liter. But more importantly, when the patient expires, there is the resistance. So the alveoli remain open. That is the P. Now on ventilator, it is called P. When the patient is breathing spontaneously, it is called CPAP. Continuous positive airway pressure is only when the patient is fully spontaneous. If the ventilator is doing part of the job, then it is P. Same thing, if the ventilator is doing it, that is P. When the patient is breathing, but at a positive end expiratory pressure, it is, that means throughout the cycling, even at end expiration, when it should have gone to zero, it is still having P. So there is a positive airway pressure throughout the cycle of the respiration. So it is called positive, continuous positive airway pressure. Okay. So what happened during the secretion? Then when there is secretion, that is a resistance, resistance which inspiration and expiration both is increasing work of breathing. It is increasing work of breathing. So we have to ensure, problem is when I come on the rounds, patient is doing Then I say, sir, I have to do it a few hours later. So, I have to do it you have cleared the floor and you can drop some more on the floor. Now you clean it again. And coffee is spilling all the time. Okay. So, this is the other on the flow volume loop. Okay. Here, inspiration, you can see this is the positive flow. Classically, this is shown like this. Some ventilators show it reverse. Don't worry about that. 
you are seeing it in this mode. Okay, so start of inspiration, you see the flow, and then up to then what what is this? Flow increased very quickly and continued, and then flow decreased, but it was still giving into the patient, so it was inspiration. Okay, from this point it becomes expiration, it falls very steeply, and here the peak expiratory, this was expiration, here peak inspiratory flow rate tuxer poncha static plateaued and came down. Here the peak expiratory flow rate. Maximum expiration occurred by this point. So you can see it has come here and then it slowly goes down. It slowly goes down. Okay. Now. This has to actually come up. Ah, so this has come from here and reached the baseline here and then gone in. What has happened? Some secrets. So you can see that this has come here. The expiratory portion, this is the expiratory portion of the loop. Huh? It does not return to the baseline here. Is there leak? Is there air trapping? This was the volume. So volume did not return to zero. Volume did not return to zero. Okay, so is it leak? Again, here that concept has been introduced. Is it air trapping? Okay, so now you see what is happening here. It has become scalloped. It has become scalloped. It's called this type of shape. It's called scalloping. Okay, so now you see that small airway obstruction, when you are breathing out, what happens? You're if there is spasm, expiration, the airways are narrowing even more, and so the rate of volume expired becomes small. So here, though effort has gone on, but the volume drop has been only this much, has been this much. Then it takes a longer time to come back. Okay? So this is in asthma. Okay? So you will find this is happening. Small airway obstruction, that is high airway resistance. During expiration, it is going slowly. Hmm? The flow, this is the flow rate. Flow rate is slow. Flow rate is slow and it gradually goes towards zero volume. It takes longer period. <coughs> no confusion? Okay? Acha. So, now we have got you are going to have this patient who is let's see. okay now this may have to create detach it we we'll leave that we yeah, have to create more slides for growing uh, no but I think I better do it uh, can I I'll exit slide show. Home. New slide. Right. Good. Yeah. Now, there are certain things I would like to show you. So now you have seen that you may have a pressure so what we have done is you have gone inspiration now expiration 
the moment that time side is over, the flow starts to go out and then gradually it goes out. And then at a particular time t, sorry, at a particular time t, then again, sorry. It will go like this. It will again go like this. So after a time, so this expiration is reaching the baseline and you are getting the next cycle. So the volume is ultimately going to zero. Okay. Now suppose, Sorry. Now the time has reached, but it has not yet reached baseline. So then it will come up. Each time there will be a residual volume left. And because within that time, patient is not able to expire the full volume air trapping will continue, auto peak will increase, the positive end expiratory pressure will automatically accumulate and increase. So my lung, which was having this volume, now from here I was breathing, but gradually it has increased. Now I am already partially inflated, so how much can I breathe? And to this also I have to do make more effort, so work of breathing will increase, so your auto peak has to be taken out. How can you do it if you can tell 20 rupees? Some sequences are going to be a little bit of 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 a little So if I increase this time, it would have gone down. If I had increased this time, it would have gone down. So let me increase the expiratory time and your air trapping will become less. So how can I do that? Because patient suppose is breathing already at 10 per minute. So I cannot keep increasing expiratory time because then the rate will go down even more. So I can increase the inspiratory flow rate so that as I said, so the breath is given quickly, inspiratory time is reduced, so balance expiratory time is increased and it gets time to reach and the trapping is less. Are we clear? Okay, so this is something that I wanted you to understand very clearly. You can reduce this trapping, air trapping by increasing the expiratory time. Whenever you get stuck on all this, you can call us on the phone and we will be talking and discussing how to set it, but you will understand why we are doing it. Okay, so I am trying to keep the information as simple as possible and give you the basic requirement. Now important is lung water will be rising, so give volume and give elastic infusion let nobody confuse you on this. We have been doing it for years and we get very good results. If your lung water is not taken out, your patient will never come out. Okay, so you have to, if necessary, don't go by that book like this. Central venous expression nowadays is no more a very accurate measure, it's more or less useful bullshit. You use that, they don't, Go by it exactly, but as long as it is not falling, you can take out fluids. And if you see the pulse oximeter waveform, if you see that the pressure is changing, that waveform height is changing with respiration, you can give fluid unless the patient is a known cardiac failure patient, known pre existing cardiac failure patient. Because if excess fluid has caused a problem, then that is fluid has to be taken out. 
So cardiac failure due to fluid overload, you have to take out fluid anyway. You can give inotrope to support the heart at that point of time, but fluid has to be taken. But if it is a coronary artery disease, it's a different kettle of fish. If the patient has a valvular lesion, then we are not talking CDP, we are not talking volumes like this. Okay, we are talking of the general public coming in and getting the benefit of ventilation. Remember, the chances of patients coming out will only depend on how bad the patient was at the time the patient came in. That is why those figures range from 25 to 75 deaths per cent. Okay, but don't be, be disappointed. This is the picture. So how quickly you get your patient, how early you get your patient, and for God's sake, don't use steroids. Unless there are other pathologies which merit steroids. Now, that is a, again a different story. We are talking pure and simple, simple public, getting uh, COVID, getting a respiratory failure, coming to you, we will treat like this. So P, FIO2 P, you are knowing inspiratory time to be adjusted. Okay, now any other questions? Remember, I have given you just a simplest way I could think of, and I have to agonize a lot to make it simple. Hmm? KISS formula was there, KISS, keep it simple, stupid. So, questions? Better have questions very soon. You'll be handling. Into have it for that. Okay. We will go over there and do some ventilator settings. Come. Let's go. You know what I'm happiest about? I could use some of the technology. audience is this. Yes, yes. Uh, don't yeah. worry, don't worry. Oh, uh, we are going to the ICU and demonstrating how to set up the ventilator. <laughs> okay. Yeah, please stay online. We are going, we are switching over to the ICU and we will be continuing from the ICU. Okay. Rakesh, we are going to ICU. We are going to ICU. From there, we will continue the practical demonstration with the ventilator. Okay, just stay with us. Just stay with us. We are going there. Yes, sir. Right. Okay.
देखो माइक म्यूट है तो तुम लोग अब अनम्यूट करो क्यों नहीं पूछता हूँ ठीक है चलो उसी तरह दिखाओ तो तुम्हें दिक्कत हो रही है कब ये उसने दिखाओ कैमरा this one, Rajat. Very copy. Memory card is not. I have to put the memory card on the other side. Oh, no. Memory card. I hate that. This is my personal. When we were in LR, तो मैं तो सबसे ज़्यादा एक्ट करके तो दैट विल गोइंग टू दिस ना तो वेल हियर इट इट कैन बी टू दिस दे कैन सी वी हैव सेट अप हाँ इन्हें सेट अप करते हैं सेट अप करने को ना अभी नहीं किया ये it's okay, the recording is happening here. Can you change the ventilator? Come, because the only way I can change the ventilator. Come, the ventilator is going to change the ventilator. Let's change it. Can you go to the second camera? 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 दूसरा चल कैमरा चेंज कर सकता है ना तो ठीक है ठीक है पालम है पालम ठीक है ठीक है बच्चों को ठीक है ठीक है एसडी कार्ड चाहिए उसको कि नहीं लाइक तो उसे एसडी का काम नहीं है कि हाउ विल दे सो गया हाउ विल नो वहाँ जो दिखाएगा हाँ वहाँ जो दिखाएगा हाउ विल दे सी सुन करो आज माइक्रोफोन हैंडहेल्ड लेगा हाँ ठीक है एक इस वाइस में यूज़ करो सुन गया सुन तो कर रहा था ना सुन करके जा रहा था आउट थोड़ा ज़ूम होगा, थोड़ा सा और ज़ूम। ये किसी एसडी में लोग? नहीं नहीं नहीं, यू कैसा लोग कर रहे हैं? यो यो बोल रहे हैं। ये तो वहाँ पे जाएगा सर। ये नहीं 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 � 
Now it should be perfect. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No. Coming to the ventilator setup, first of all, we have to know the about the ventilator circuit. So this is the ventilator circuit. This is the this is the simple ventilator circuit. We have many other types of ventilator circuit which comes with uh, heating element like Fisher Packel, and uh, there are different types of ventilator circuits. So this is the simplest ventilator circuit. So. It has two limbs, one is the excretory limb and one is the excretory limb. So in the ventilator machine, you will have the symbol, which is the excretory limb and which is the excretory limb. Here we can see that an arrow is going inside the patient, that is the excretory limb. And here we can see one arrow coming out of the patient, that is the excretory limb. And this ventilator circuit, after going to the patient, it is being connected to a heat and moist exchange filter. After that, it has, it has been connected to the capnometer by which we can measure the uh, end tidal carbon dioxide. Following that, it is connected to a T nebulizer by which we can do nebulization of the patient. After that, it is connected to a swivel mount catheter which can be expanded and which can be made short to decrease the dead space. After that, it is connected to a, either to a tracheostomy tube or to the endotracheal tube. In this fashion, it is connected to a tracheostomy tube. And this is the closed suction system, which is connected to a, connected to a suction machine and whenever needed, suctioning is done. Now, in patients coming with uh, COVID-19 positive status, if the patient is needed to come to ICU, that means the patient is already having ARDS-like feature, where the lung and the alveoli is flooded with fluids. In that case, 
we have to intubate the patient as soon as possible to oxygenate and ventilate the patient. In those cases, we have to minimize the exposure rate and we have to be very cautious by wearing PPE and we have to be very prepared to avoid any spillage or of secretion or any discharge from the patient. So what we do is all the team members of who are going to intubate the patient and ventilate the patient has to wear PPE and after that we have to go with the rapid sequence induction and intubation protocol. So in that what we do is then induction as an and a muscle relaxation to intubate the patient. And in COVID positive patients we have to use those muscle relaxation who has a very short onset of action. For example, succinctin or rocuronium. But in patients, if the patient is COVID positive student, the patient might be on sepsis with high, pot high potassium level. So better to avoid scolding in those patients. So we will be going with rocuronium at the highest level dose. 1.2 mg per kg. So after intubating the patient, we have to set up the ventilation in such a way that is similar to adult respiratory distress syndrome. So in those cases, we have to put the patient either on volume assist control or pressure assist control. Before that, we have to be very particular that patient is totally sedated and totally paralyzed. For sedation, we can use morphine in intermittent dose, like 4 hourly or 6 hourly. And for paralysis, we can use long acting or short acting muscle relaxants or intermittent acting muscle relaxants. We can either use intermittent doses or we can use infusion also. In pressure assist control mode, the parameters which are more important is the inspiratory pressure the rate and the inspiratory time and in ARDS patient the most important thing is the PEEP. So if the patient is already having ARDS, we have to set this inspiratory pressure. We will go from 15 and go by increasing on. If this inspiratory pressure and the rate, suppose we start from 14. And in this 14 respiratory rate with inspiratory pressure 18, if the patient is generating adequate tidal volume, that means the patient is getting adequate saturation or oxygenation. Before that, we have to see the saturation also of the patient. If the saturation is 100%, that means with this inspiratory pressure and this respiratory rate and this PEEP, the patient is okay with this ventilation, but in that one, so, those cases, the patient is maintaining SPO2 more than 92 percent with P5. So we'll definitely go and increase the P from 5 to 7. By 2. If at 7 also patient is not maintaining saturation, after 20 minutes we can increase the P to from 7 to 9. Gradually you can go and increase it up to 15 or 18. But the problem with the P is that while we go and increase in the P, the venous return of the patient will decrease. So patient might have hypotension. And in this COVID positive patients, we will be already having an arterial line which will be transduced and the central venous catheter which, is, which will be transduced already with the monitor so that we can monitor the central venous pressure and the arterial blood pressure. So accordingly we can monitor the volume status of the patient and give 
fluid or uh, crystalloids, colloids, or any su anaerobic supports, whatever needed and whatever is the best for the patient. So we will be having all those monitors with the patients. So if hypotension is there with high peak, we can, first of all, we have to manage the hypotension. So if hypotension is manageable with fluids or anotropes, we have to deal accordingly because in ARDS patient, we cannot give much fluids to the patients. Similarly with the FiO2, initially we will start with FiO2 100. After observing for 20 minutes, if the, FiO2, if the SpO2 is maintained above 92 percent, then gradually decrease the FiO2 from 100. From 80 percent, we will decrease from the second interval till maintaining SpO2 more than 2 percent. And after coming to 60 percent, we see 50 minutes. Then we will go gradually go decreasing by 60 to 50, then to 40 and we will stay in 40%. In this ventilator, we have to set up the oxygenation manually. But in some other ventilators like Hamilton, within the Intel even mode, the SPOP is tapered gradually by the, by the ventilator itself. The minor ventilation also, it is automatically set up by the ventilator with automatic automatically PP is also generated by the ventilator according to the patient needs. But in this ventilator we have to set up manually. And coming to the inspiratory time, this inspiratory time, if the patient is having much secretions or leaks in the RDS, then we have to, sometimes what happens is that patient cannot expirate the carbon dioxide which is needed. In that cases, we can increase the expiratory time. In ARDS, we used to give uh, inspiratory and expiratory ratio usually 1 is to 1 or 1 is to 2. Similarly, in the volume assist control, the important thing is that we used to see the tidal volume, respiratory rate and the inspiratory flow. With the peak. And PIP is the important thing in ARDS. In ARDS, what we do is, we everybody know that the normal tidal volume is 6 to 8 ml per kg of the patient. So in ARDS, what we start is, from the lower side of the tidal volume, we used to start the ventilation. That means 6 ml per kg. And gradually, if needed, we used to increase or decrease. So in ARDS patient, Tidal volume will start from 6 ml per kg and gradually with that we will uh, adjust the respiratory rate so that the minor ventilation is achieved. And inspiratory flow rate we have to increase keep in the increase pattern that means on the higher pattern like 80 to 90 or 90 to 100 liter per minute. And P4 I have discussed in Assist control, similarly we have to adjust in the volume assist control also. FiO2 similarly, we have to go on decreasing because 60% uh, FiO2 for more than 60 minutes is very toxic to the lung. So whatever FiO2 we have to adjust, we have to keep it below 60%. Other parameters you can uh, like peak, inspiratory flow, respiratory rate, inspiratory time, we can adjust accordingly. And other thing is that Patients sometimes may have metabolic acidosis. We, that thing we will come from the will come to know from the ABG because arterial line will already be there. So <coughs> we can do ABG timely. And if metabolic acidosis is already present in the patient, we have to correct that thing first. Otherwise, patient will still having hypotension and low saturation. So. We have to be very cautious in the management of ARDS patients with all those monitors like in intra-RPL blood pressure, central venous pressure, then uh, we, all, we also have EV1000 machine in that we can see that uh, extra vascular lung water, whatever is there, we have to 
check out that extravascular lung water. So in that monitor we can check out that extra vascular lung water accordingly and we can take timely reading. So these two parameters, these two ventilator settings is uh, good for that volume assist control and pressure assist control. So this much I will tell for ARDS patients. If you have any questions, you can ask. Uh, after this we will have turbo suction. How to do endotracheal suctioning when cleaning the suctioning catheter while without opening? Okay. Any questions? The answer is you will question me. Sameer? Uh, sir, I have a question. Maybe I have a microphone suggestion to set that. From this, so if you have any questions to ask, then we will start turbo suction. So, do you have questions, sir? Let me do it. Ah. Question has not come. Say that. Yeah, I am. It has not come. The question has not come. And Dr. Khairun, can you hear me? Dr. Khairun? Khairun, can you hear me? Dr. Khairun? Khairun, can you hear me? Dr. Khairun, can you hear me? And Dr. Khairun, can you hear me? Very good. Yes, this form of We have requested them to mute their mic because otherwise the disturbance will be there. Disconnect, disconnect, disconnect. That was section in the Really, I'm going to go to the other 
सस्पेक्टेड है अभी तक आया अगर पीटेंटिक है तो पीटेंटिक है अभी तक रिपोर्ट नहीं आया लुकम नेगेटिव है लुकम नेगेटिव है जब गिविंग सम मनी टू माइक्रो एंड मेकिंग नेगेटिव नो नो आई थिंक इट इज सो दिस इज सिंपल बिकॉज़ दिस इज स्टिल ट्रेवल बॉडी ओनली जस्ट सो टेक इट दैट साइड जस्ट दे आई कैन टू नो ना Because if I would bring the duty, I met him. Ah, we will be now. Hello, yes, if you sir. please uh, okay, uh, give some attention. We will be now demonstrating the uh, close suction technique. Close suction technique, a turbo close suction technique. Okay, because in these uh, COVID patients, we do not want to open the circuit as far as possible. Okay. so we will be using the closed suction so that that demonstration will be given now okay yes sir <laughs> demonstrating the use of the oral care system so that the, the mouth can be clean so a bit more loudly can you hear say it is the kimberly clark it is the Kimber kimberly clark oral care system and this is for oral suctioning and the other is the brush so demonstrate so deep throat suctioning is being done it is a very soft rounded tip which is non traumatic to the pharynx and tongue the brush that was used you can demonstrate you can uh, first show how it was covered no no see everything please tell yeah you can see zoom you can see the uh, tip that is now covered with that blue collar and that is kept and we can show you the brush this is a silicone brush it is very very soft and there is a handle over there where you can suck suction port you can press it 
and when after you have brushed with the chlorhexidine you can just suck it from there and the mouth remains clean the whole purpose of this is that the mouth does not become the source for bacteria which then trickles down through the cup over across the cup into the trachea we have a protocol in our icu that after the oral care one hour later the subglottic suction is done for the micro cuff laryngeal tube uh, uh, endotracheal tube so micro cuff tracheal tube is used and they clean it then they do that suction after one hour <coughs> so each time they are cleaning it the suction force you will notice if we zoom on to the suction we use a minimum suction force first we set it to zero and then we use a minimum suction force so bar now you can see this is the closed suction system can you zoom can you show that back here yeah. can you zoom on that we are using their turbo suction system from halyard avanos systems and this is she's the, that is the lock she is using to press. When she presses, it will suck. So around 70 to 150 centimeter pressure they are using. Connect. Uh, depending on the, if this is the uh, tube, uh, we have to insert around 12 centimeter. So if it, in the tracheostomy tube they insert about 12 centimeter. And in the endotracheal tube, uh, it's around, uh, 22 they insert about, uh, so that is about 22 centimeters. Now there are two sizes of these suction catheters. One is for tracheostomy, one is for the endotracheal tube. Now uh, it has to be, uh, we have to do it in, uh, uh, actually, yeah. uh, we cannot do it for long time because patient will be in distress. So we have, it has to be done in like 10 seconds, 10 seconds. We have to insert, uh, we shouldn't uh, suck it while inserting. Uh, we have to insert first uh, up to the desired length. Then we uh, put it out slowly. Then uh, we, we press this once uh, this uh, taking out. So you so, see the suctioning, when the catheter is being inserted, first it is unlocked. Yeah. So you can so demonstrate the unlock at the neck. So you cannot suck it at this time. So you have to unlock, you have to switch this button. And now it's unlocked. It's free now. And after it's free, you insert the desired length around uh, 10 to 12 centimeters. Uh, For tracheostomy, 10 to 12 centimeters insertion. For endotracheal, it is another uh, suction catheter, which is about 22 centimeters you will insert. Oh, the patient is otherwise continues to be ventilated. Uh, before, uh, before suctioning, we have to press uh, one button here. Uh, On the ventilator, uh, it says 100% suction. A or A. So during the whole procedure, 100% oxygen flows and after the procedure, automatically it goes back to the original setting. After suctioning is done, this is very important because if the mucus remains on the tubing, then that will become source of infection. So the value of this turbo suction catheter system is that you can see she is injecting the fluid over there. It is coming around the tube and then there is a jet. You can zoom in. You can see the jet, the water is coming through this circuit over there. So here the suction force is being increased because this is no more in the trachea. This is only in the, 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 the tubing system. So the jet suctioning so that the water washes the mucus and other things from the uh, tube and it cleans it very thoroughly. One more repeat she is going to do. Pushing about 10 ml every time. So 
So yeah. first they are, yeah, so that you are pressing it and sucking. Yeah. So you see they press that suction and the syringe goes down by itself. Water comes into that plastic bag and now this is going to be sucked out automatically. The port has been closed. So you see the whole process of suctioning and the cleaning of the suction catheter is completed in a sterile manner without opening the circuit. The other advantage is that because we are not opening the circuit, in this ARDS patient with COVID, you will find that the airways tend to collapse, alveoli tend to collapse. So here, because they have not opened the circuit, this damage is going to be much less. So you don't have to re-recruit the collapsing alveoli. Your alveoli remain distended and effective throughout the time. Any questions about this? system. Any questions? We cannot get, we cannot hear that. Okay, well just. Any questions you may have from the museum? Any questions? You can ask some questions. <laughs> if you want that the whole process be shown again, it will be shown, but you have to tell. <laughs> So you have seen oral cleaning and suctioning. Okay, I think that is enough. And this. You cannot throw out the brush and look for another brush. You have to buy the set again. Mm -hmm. ah, because this is coming as a complete set. <coughs> it's not a toothbrush. Toothbrush with a suction incorporated coming from within the brush. So that when you are cleaning the chlorexidine, if the whole mouth remains full of chlorexidine. I forget. Hamaraya to hospital supply. So that is. When a patient pays for treasury challenge, you will have a COVID patient to the SI. But our ventilator associated pneumonia is very low. You do the suctioning, for the cleaning, one hour later, subglottic suction. Use the microcuff suction, endotracheal tube, microcuff. So, cuff ke upar, the cuff is peculiar. It has got like this and then long thing and parallel then like this. So, it is not like this. So, the surface area of contact is large. Its value is pressure per unit area is even lower because the surface area of contact is more. And these patients you have to ventilate with high pressure. So, the pressure of the cuff, the submucosal flow becomes very poor. So, with this micro cuff system, the tracheal mucosa is not necrosed easily and uh, uh, then one hour later you have done this supraglottic suction 
Then midway through that shift, they will do one more suction. Next team that comes on the shift immediately will do oral care. Then one hour later, they will again do suction. Super tough. Then mid shift, they will do uh, suction. Then she goes off duty, next person comes again oral care. So three times this is happening and many brushing and six times in the whole day the supra suction. So this helps to reduce the ventilated associated pneumonia. Ek to bacteria come hai, jo trickle karega, micro cup may trickle come karta hai, suprachlorotic suction, that also takes it out. And whatever goes down is chlorhexidine ke saath, but very small amount. So the chances of bacteria proliferation is low. Yes, Rakesh, anything? Okay, so tomorrow we will have um, the other uh, practical demonstrations. <coughs> okay. So what, uh, what, uh, what uh, topic will be discussing, sir? Uh, tomorrow I have to see that, that talk. What are the things? Sir, tomorrow is only there. Okay, tomorrow is... Oh, tomorrow we don't have a session. Tomorrow is uh, off. Oh. Tomorrow, second. Good Friday. Okay. Oh, okay, sir. So, a few rounds, it will resume on, uh, yeah. on Saturday. It will be resume on Monday. No, Saturday. Saturday, Saturday will be there. We will join again. Okay. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Good day, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Right, good day, sir. Good day. So, each of them we will be putting on a link so that whenever you call up, we will be able to respond. See, but Saturday.